Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series I enjoy a great deal. It's a, a series on the Great Controversy, and it's entitled Rebellion and Redemption. That sounds like a right kind of a progression, doesn't it, to go from rebellion to redemption? This is lesson number 12 in that series from March 19 of 2016, entitled The Church Militant. Hmm, is church militant a, some kind of a contradiction in ideas? A church is supposed to be loving and kind and generous and not militant, right? So what's a church militant? Well, let's see if we can figure that out as we study together. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we bow before you once again, claiming your promises. We look at these messages that you wrote. You had your friend John write from the Isle of Patmos to those seven congregations in western Turkey. And we have looked at them in the context of the progress of the Christian church down through the ages, and they seem to fit. Help us to understand how each one of these churches has a part to play and what part it plays that might give us some knowledge and understanding of, of your working with us as human beings is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to be looking primarily at the passages in Revelation 2 and 3 where uh, John describes those seven churches in western Turkey. But we need to get a little bit of context. When Jesus ascended to heaven, ten days before Pentecost, he left a small group of followers with a task that even they could not possibly have comprehended. Do you remember what he said in Matthew 28, 19 and 20? Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Does that sound like a real common thing for a Jew to do? Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you, be with you always to the end of the age. And what was the usual response when you said a Jew needs to go out and reach out to Gentiles? Over my dead body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. Resistance. In the beginning, they thought their work was exclusively to the Jews in Palestine. Through a variety of circumstances which we've discussed in previous lessons, God finally convinced them that the gospel was to go to all the world. Paul with Barnabas, and then later with Silas, carried the gospel to Western Asia Minor, now Turkey, and on into Europe. Others, no doubt, were involved as well. Near the end of the first century, the Roman government attempted to kill John by throwing him into a pot of boiling oil. Now, which John is this? The Apostle John. This is the one of the disciples, the Apostle John. They threw him into a pot of boiling oil, uh, but he did not die. The same people who had thrown him into the pot of boiling oil had to pull him back out again. And you wonder where I got that? Well, of course, it's in the ancient writings, but Ellen White uh, uh, supports that view. L look at these words. John was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil, but the Lord preserved the life of his faithful servant, even as he preserved the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. As the words were spoken, thus perish all who believe in that deceiver, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, John declared, my master patiently suffered to all that Satan has his angels could devise to humiliate and torture him. He gave his life to save the world. I am honored in being permitted to suffer for his sake. I am a weak, sinful man. Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled. He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. These words had their influence, and John was removed from the cauldron by the very men who had cast him in. Acts of the Apostles, page 570, paragraph 1 and 2. So what did they decide to do with John next? If you can't kill him. Exile him. Exile him. Put him somewhere where nobody, nobody can hear anything he has to say. And so what did he do? He wrote the book. Right? Exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Exiled to the Isle of Patmos. And I had the privilege of 
be going there about a year and a half, well, not even a year ago, I guess, yet. Now, last summer, beautiful place. And what happened while he was there? He wrote the book of Revelation. And if we understand the history correctly, when the new emperor came along and replaced the old one, and the new one was opposed to the old one, he let most of these people loose. And apparently John went back to his friends in Ephesus, and he may have taken the book of Revelation with him. He might have figured out some way to get it back to them earlier or not. We don't know. Or he may have just taken it with him. Well, in Revelation 12, 7 to 12, which is not what we're going to be focusing on today, but remember that talks about how the great controversy got started. Where? Let's just read those verses just really quickly. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So where's the devil now? Right here amongst right us. Right here on this earth. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his message has shown his authority for the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. So who's accusing us in heaven? Satan. 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 Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb. How do you win victory over somebody by the blood of the Lamb? Is that a new kind of weapon? By the demonstration of Christ. Absolutely. If Satan starts the war by deceiving a whole lot of people, what's the, how, what's the answer to that? Tell him the truth, right? So Jesus' life is to tell the truth. So some of us, it may be necessary for us to be willing to give up our lives and die, and so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there, but how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he is filled with rage, because he knows that he has only a little time left. So what do you call people who really believe they only have a little time left? Desperate. Adventists. <laughs> <laughs> Desperate Adventists. Okay, with a small letter. That doesn't mean they're Seventh-day Adventists. It means they're looking forward to, or they're not looking forward to, they're looking with horror to the possibility that Christ might come again soon. Well, Revelation 13 and 14 describe how Satan will be almost 100% effective in converting the world to his side. But through the three angels' messages, God will use a small remnant who will endure under very difficult circumstances and stand firm on his side of the great controversy to finish up the work of the Christian churches through the ages. So in Revelation 2 and 3, we read about the personal approach that Jesus has taken to each of the churches in western Turkey to which John wrote. And what have we, what have we said about what those churches represent? They represent... One view is that they represent the, the Christian church down through the ages, from the time of the apostles down to the present time and the future. Did, did they apply in any way to the local churches there that John was writing to? I'm sure they did. Okay. Do we have other examples where a prophecy applies locally and then maybe it has a, a bigger application later? Can you think of an example? Isaiah 7. Isaiah 7 is a perfect example where Hebrew, I mean, where, where uh, Isaiah's son, one of his sons, is called Emmanuel. And he's born, it says, before he can say mommy and daddy, these enemies that are fighting them are going to be gone. But the verse says what? A young woman will give birth and his name will eventually be Wonderful Counselor. Almighty God. Prince of Peace. Who's that talking about? Matthew realized that this, that this is a prediction of, about Jesus. So he says a virgin will give birth. And of course in, in Matthew's day it was a virgin. Okay? 
Well, I think this. I think the seven churches also represent different people mm -hmm. at different stages of their experience. Yeah. So we're going to look at some of those kinds of ideas presented in this lesson. Um, and by the way, do you think John knew any of those people that he was writing to? Probably knew a lot of them, of the actual people who lived in these churches he was writing to. Well, unfortunately, the story of how many of the churches were trying to straddle the fence between being Christians and being a part of this world. John, now nobody today would try to straddle the fence here, would they? Hmm. John, um, let's see. John received a vision while on Patmos concerning issues that affected each of those churches. Jesus himself was reaching out to them. It is through those churches and the larger groups of Christians that they represented down through the ages that God intends to spread the message of Christianity to the world under the close eyes of the onlooking universe. And those are verses we looked at several times. Ephesians 3, 8 to 10, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Well, let's look at an example of one of these messages to one of the church, first churches, especially the church of Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, right? So now let's understand clearly, who's the angel of the church of Ephesus? And he talks about a lampstand that belongs to the church of Ephesus as well. In, back in chapter 1, what is that? Well, mm. angel means messenger. messenger. Yeah. Uh, is, is he saying this is a, a message to that church or to the leader of that church? Okay, that would be part of it. And so the messages usually came to the church members in those days. Remember, you couldn't afford to buy a Bible. There wasn't such a thing as a Bible. You could, you could maybe give ac occasionally get access to a scroll that would have one book on it or something like that. So the, one, the spiritual leaders of the people would be the pastors or the, in some cases, maybe itinerant preachers like Paul and so forth who would bring messages to these churches. Um, so this angel would be one of those, maybe, uh, the pastor of the church at Ephesus. So the, this is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, who is that? Jesus. Yeah, back to chapter 1, it's clearly talking about Jesus. I know what you have done. I know you, how hard you have worked and how patient you have been. But by the way, what do we know about people in the early days in Ephesus? Do we know anybody who worked there? John was there, wasn't he? John worked there. Paul worked Paul. there. Paul worked there. He was Pub there for about three years, wasn't he? It was a publishing center of sorts. It became it? a publishing center. For Apollos the, was there too. Apollos wasn't? was there. Can you think of anybody else? Well, this is a very well-received or well-documented church, right? Okay, there's two other people you should be able to remember. Is it Onesimus? Well, Onesimus, it's quite possible that Onesimus, the one about whom the book of Philemon, Philemon is written, ended up being a leader at the church. We know that there was an, an Onesimus. We don't know but for sure it's the same one who ended up being the elder in the church at Ephesus you know, after the apostles were all gone. So that may be another one. There's still two others that I think of right away who had been associates with Paul. Do you remember who they were? I'm thinking about Mark. No. But he was a youngster. Yeah. Well, um, Barnabas and Silas were the other well, long-term ones. The ones you want to be thinking about are a husband and wife. Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla. How did they have anything to do with Ephesus? Remember that Paul, on his way home from Corinth, passed through Ephesus. And they said, please stay and we need you here. And Paul says, well, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, but... I have some friends here, and I think they would be willing to stay. And he actually left Aquila and Priscilla there to get, really get the church going in Ephesus. So we know a lot of people who worked in Ephesus, right? So in the early days, the church at Ephesus was really blessed. There are those who say that the church in Ephesus was the fourth, I mean, not the church in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the ancient Near Eastern, well, the Mediterranean world. Can you... 
Can you guess which was the largest city? Rome. Rome. Do you know which was the second largest? Alexandria. Alexandria in Egypt. What about the third largest? Oh, no. You can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Antioch in Syria. Oh, okay. That was Paul's home church. And Ephesus was probably the fourth largest in that world. So we're talking big cities by ancient standards. Hundreds of thousands of people living in these places. So Paul is writing to, I mean, John is writing the words of Jesus to these people. I know that you cannot tolerate evil people and that you have tested those who say they are apostles but are not and have found out that they are liars. So the church at Ephesus had had some very good apostles to get, to really set a standard. I mean, Paul and John and maybe Onesimus and Aquila and Priscilla and, you know, Apollos. I mean, these are people who are praised in the Bible for having the message, right? So apparently these people in Ephesus, at least at the beginning, had their eyes and their, their minds carefully tuned to the truth versus falsehood, and they didn't tolerate any liars. You are patient, you have suffered for my sake, and you have not given up. But this is what I have against you. You do not love me now as you did at first. Think how far you have fallen. Turn from your sins and do what you did at first. If you don't turn from your sins, I will come to you and take your lampstand from its place. But this is what you have in your favor. You hate what the Nicolaitans do as much as I do. Now, we don't have a long time to go into big discussion of the Nicolaitans. But what, someone can, what do we know about the Nicolaitans? Almost nothing, but they are mentioned twice in these two books. These, I'm sorry, these two chapters. And there is some evidence that Nicholas, one of the seven deacons that was chosen, apparently started a, a sort of offshoot of the Christian church. And he went around trying to tell people, well, you, you know, you don't have to be quite so strict about observing what God says. You can do, you know, relax your standards a little bit, etc. And that's something, apparently those were called the Nicolaitans. But not all the deacons were like Stephen? Not all of them apparently were like Stephen. Philip did pretty well, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Well, coming back here, the church at Ephesus represents what Adventists have typically said was the time period between 33 A.D. and what happened in 33 A.D.? Stoning of Stephen. Mm, no. I'm sorry. I, I, actually, it's a mistake here. It should be 31 A.D. Is, 1 A.D. is what I meant. What happened in 31 A.D.? Jesus yeah, that would be the crucifixion of Jesus up until around 100 A.D. And what happened approximately 100 A.D.? That was well, when the last of the apostles died. Yeah, that was about the time when John died. The last of the original apostles died. So they were, these were the times of the apostles. But by the end of that period, none of the apostles were left. The devil was doing his best to stop the spread of Christianity. I mean, if you had been the devil, and think, think about what happened in that, in that century, from the point where, if you read the early chapters of Desire of Ages, the devil thought he, once again, he had just about won. I mean, everybody, even the people who claimed to be the saints, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were on the devil's side, the way they were re misrepresenting God. And then, bang, here comes Jesus. And then Jesus dies, and they, the devil thinks, Oh, I've got it, I've got it. These people, none of these disciples are going to stand up and, and, and really carry on his message. I, all I have to do is get rid of these 11 or whatever and it'll be all over. And then whoosh, Pentecost hits. And I mean, just think of the, what the devil went through in that first century. But anyway, so Paul spent years in Ephesus and so did John. Both of them survived threats on their lives while working in Ephesus. Ephesus was the publication center for the early church, as Jim mentioned. What do we mean by a publication center? Copying Bibles. Yeah, they would, passages. if, if a passages came, or, or let's say one of these books, maybe a letter from Paul would come to Ephesus, and the people at Ephesus would sit down very carefully and copy so that other people could have, could have copies of these books. So that was a kind of a, Ephesus was a large, wealthy city. Was that part of their problem? Well, Ephesus was certainly at the center of Satan's attacks on the early church. 
Heretics in various forms tried to corrupt the church. While we do not know very much about it, there was a heresy apparently started by Nicholas. We've mentioned that. In what respect had the early Ephesian church left its first love? What, what do you think that means, you've left your first love? Any idea what that means? Lost your enthusiasm, maybe. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Does that ever happen in our day? Have you ever known people who became church members and they were so enthusiastic and they were so excited about discovering the new truth and over a year or two or three they just sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. and maybe even they stopped going to church? Left, yeah. Did the Christian church in Ephesus gradually settle in and let their zeal die? It sounds, kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? Well, then there were the churches of Smyrna and Pergamum. I um, guess we can take time to read those few verses. Starting with verse 8 of chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This is the message from the one who is the first and the last who died and lived again. I know your troubles. I know that you are poor, but you really... Are, but really you are rich. I know the evil things said against you by those who claim to be Jews but are not. They are a group that belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of anything you're about to suffer. Listen, the devil will put you to the test by having some of you thrown into prison and your troubles will last ten days. Be faithful to me even if it means death and I will give you the li life as your prize of victory. If you have ears then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who win the victory will not be hurt by the second death. I can tell you that today in the city of Izmir, which is what used to be Smyrna, there is one, well, no, there's, there's actually more than one Christian church. There's a small Adventist church that meets sort of secretly. I, as far as I know, there's one church that's openly labeled as a Christian church, and it's kept locked. You have to get very special permission even to enter the building, because they're terribly afraid that, you know, if there's any kind of Christian, you know, th there's a small group of people that come there and worship, I guess, once a, once a week, but uh, I'm, not tra I'm talking about not just Adventist churches, I'm talking about all Christian churches. There's one church. We were very lucky because we, we arrived there and someone had made a, just, we were just going to take pictures of the outside of the church, and someone had made uh, arrangements to get in and have a, a Christian service inside, so we were able to get in and take some pictures inside and see some of the people there, um, even though these were a group of, of Catholics from from Poland that had made arrangements to get into the church. So, yes, Dennis. Do, do we have any understanding of the, this uh, the trouble that will last 10 days? Was that 10 yes, days you refer to? One of the emperors that just a short time before Constantine decided that it was his job to wipe out the Christian church. It was getting more and more influential, more powerful. He did everything he could. There was a terrible persecution from around about 300 A.D. till about 310 A.D. We just a little while before Constantine came in and decided, no, we're not going to fight him anymore. We're going to join him. And he declared Christianity to be the official religion of the, of the Roman Empire. Yeah, there was a terrible time of persecution. Um, well, to the angel of the church of Pergamum, right? This is the message from the one who has a sharp two-edged sword. And where does that sword come from? Remember, I know where you live. There where Satan is his throne. You are true to me, and you did not abandon your faith in me even during the time when Antipas, my faithful witness, was killed there where Satan lives. But there are a few things I have against you. There are some among you who follow the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak how to lead the people of Israel into sin by persuading them to eat food, that had been offered to idols and to practice sexual immorality. In the same way, you have people among you who follow the teachings of the Nicolaitans. There, Nicolaitans are mentioned again. Now turn from your sins. If you don't, I will come to you soon and fight against those people with the sword that comes out of my mouth. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. And just, we don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but what would be a sword that comes out of the mouth? Truth separating from error. Yeah. If, as we've said many times, if the problem with the great controversy started by lies about God, the, 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 the truth coming out of the mouth of Jesus is going to be the answer, right? And be the solution. So that's very 
It's interesting, um, how many of you have heard of Polycarp? Yeah. A number of you have heard of Polycarp. He was one of the next generation of Christian leaders after the apostles, and apparently was actually worked with the Apostle John for a period of time. And then he became the leader of the church in, um, in uh, Smyrna. And um, when he was quite elderly, the Roman government found out where he was, came and, and, and uh, arrested him. And when they came to arrest him, he was at the home of a Christian. And he said to the lady in the house, please give these people, these soldiers, some food to eat. And while they were eating, he stood in the corner of the room where they were eating. She's a Christian is feeding these Roman soldiers who have come to arrest him. He is praying for every Christian that he can think of in the Roman Empire. I mean, imagine. And they took him out. They wanted to throw him to the lions, but it was some things that didn't work out, so they ended up burning him at the stake. So this is the kind of people we're talking about here, the leaders. Smyrna represents a period between about 100 A.D. to about 320 A.D. And what happened around 320 A.D.? Christianity was Constantine. called the state religion, so yeah. to speak. Constantine. Constantine. Now, it took a while for that idea to take hold. Christianity didn't really take hold of the Roman Empire until about the times of, of um, Justinian, which was, what is that, a couple hundred years later before, before Christianity really, really sort of controlled. Um, but, but at least it, got, it was officially the, the, the religion of the, of the Christian church, I mean, of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the Roman Empire. So also, uh, uh, so this period, the, the Smyrna period ran from 320 A.D., I'm sorry, the Pergamum period ran from 320 A.D. to 538 A.D. What happened in 538 A.D.? Well, we see what we call the Pope today start to manifest his power. That's the beginning of what we call the 1260-day prophecy. It's actually 1260-year prophecy, but it's prophetic days, also known as the 42-month prophecy, also known as the three-and-a-half-year prophecy. Where, where are those prophecies? Where do you find those? Daniel. Daniel and Revelation. Daniel and Revelation, right. I know of six places uh, that that period of time is mentioned. Mm -hmm. in, it's mentioned in both Old and New Testament. It seems like it ought to be a significant date. Yeah. So what happened in that 1260-year period? Do we know what started it and what ended it? Well, we call it the Dark Ages. Yeah, we call it the Dark Ages. It's interesting that the beasts that it talks about in the book of Revelation are representatives of religious authority that have taken on also political and civil authority. So you put those together, and then you use your, your military and civil authority to try to enforce your religion. That's, that's evil in the, in, in, the verse, in the ideas of Daniel and, and, and Revelation. So in 538, basically, what happened was the Pope, um, well, he wasn't really the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, remember that the emperors of, of Rome had moved from Rome, and where was their headquarters now? Constantinople. Constantinople, quite a long ways away. So over here in Rome, there was a kind of power vacuum. And the Pope gradually assumed more and more authority. And finally, in about the time, 536 to 538, somewhere in there like that, um, he became a military leader, led his, his, the armies of Rome out, and conquered a large group of military people, much larger than his army. And he thought, wow, you know, I can be not only a spiritual leader, I can be someone with power and authority and military might. And so he, became, he just basically assumed both the civil, the, the, the military, and the religious authority. And, of course, that was the first real pope. It was replayed by, by Muhammad and his followers. Yeah. Same time, the philosophy. A couple hundred years later? Yeah. Six, 100 years later? 609 A.D. was Muhammad's mm -hmm. first 
vision or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That Bishop of Rome uh, conquering many times the number of forces that he has was a after an uh, epidemic of malaria, yeah. apparently, and lots, thousands of the invaders had malaria. Is that right? Um, so sick they could hardly yeah, fight. Yeah, could hardly fight, so he slaughtered them. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had, yeah, anyway. Yeah. In 533, I think it is, yeah. that, that Justinian declared the Bishop of Rome uh, the corrector of all heretics uh, and the head of all churches. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we use that date? Well, Justinian uh, sent his emperor, Belisarius, uh, his, military general. his military general, to uh, uh, defend, uh, support uh, the Bishop of Rome. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the Rome was then liberated from the invaders in 538. Uh, so that's when, when he actually was able to assume the power yeah. that had been given to him earlier. Well, we mentioned the Nicolaitans and the followers of Balaam. What do we know about those two people? They seem to be parallel terms. Here's uh, something from a commentary on the book of Revelation by Ronko Stefanovich an Adventist. Nicholas and Balaam seem to be parallel terms. Nicholas is, is a compound Greek word, nikau and laos, meaning the one who conquers people. Balaam can be derived from two Hebrew words, am, people, and baal, from bela, to destroy or to swallow, meaning destruction of the people. So, what does that mean? Well, these people are trying to cause havoc, right, in God's church. Well, then what comes after Pergamum? We haven't said much about Pergamum, but we need to keep moving. Thyatira. Thyatira. Well, during the Thyatira time, what happened? I'm sorry. Actually, we I'm, I'm, I jumped ahead. The Pergamum time. What happens during the Pergamum time? 538 to, no, two, uh, 320 to 538. This is a time when Constantine is declared to Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire. By 538, it had become the official religion. And in that process, what happened? We call it syncretism. What's syncretism? A blending of different philosophies and, and religions pagan and, and so and, forth. And, a lot of pagan influences entered the Christian church. The day of worship was changed. The, a lot of holidays, pagan holidays, were christened into Christian holidays. We know that's the story about Easter. That's the story of Christmas. Uh, these were originally pagan holidays. Well, then we come to Thyatira. What do we know about Thyatira? Basically represents uh, during the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. Almost a thousand years maybe even a little over a thousand years, from the 538 to around about 1560. What was happening in the early 1500s? Reformation, Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation. And it wasn't until about 1550 or 60 that that Protestant Reformation really impacted things in Europe and it really started to really take hold. So um, it was during that time that the, the church in Rome, the church in Europe, the church, basically the Christian church, went through a really per a dark period. And who were uh, remaining faithful during that time? Waldenses. The Waldenses. Albigenses. The Albigenses, the Vaudois, as they're sometimes called. Um, and then, of course, there's the Protestant Reformation. We think about people like John Wycliffe and Martin Luther and William Tyndall and Zwingli and so forth. So toward the end of this period, uh, the Protestant Reformation was just really going, getting to getting going. So, um, next comes the period of Sardis. What do we know about Sardis? Yeah. It's very interesting. If you visit Sardis today, you'll find two interesting places that you would want to visit if you go there. Both of them are, are quite unique because in one, there's a, a large pagan temple that was used for pagan worship for about 800 years. It was never completely finished. And in one corner, back corner of that 
pagan church, pagan temple, is a little Christian church attached to it. Why it's there, I have no idea. And then you go to another place where there's a big government bath, a Roman bath, and that's the place where you went and you exercised, and there, were, there was a, a hot room, and there was a, temp, a warm, lukewarm room, and there was a cold room, and so forth, and you would, then you'd go out on the field, and you exercise, and come back and forth, and so forth. And in the changing rooms on the side of that exercise area, there was a Jewish synagogue. The changing rooms were turned into a Jewish synagogue. What does that tell you about what was going on in people's minds? There's a pagan temple, and attached to it is a little Christian church. There's a big exercise area with public baths, and there's a Jewish synagogue. Yeah. Well, with respect to uh, pagan temples and and uh, Christian churches, there's a whole history where where uh, the 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 new Christian church, uh, the, the Roman church, their uh, basilica, their their cathedrals, were built on sites mm -hmm. of pagan worship, and even Saint Peter's is and built in Rome in Rome is, is built on pagan worship. And uh, the smaller church, I'm trying to recall the name. Um, uh, in Rome or where? In Rome, in Rome. Oh. Um, Lateran, you're talking about Lateran? No, no, I, I'm talking about, uh, the, it, it was one of the early church fathers. Um, and when they've excavated it, mm -hmm. uh, they found a um, a temple or a worship site. A pagan, a pagan temple underneath? Yes, uh, to Mithra, uh, yeah. Mithrium. Yeah. And uh, again... Or Ebolium and so forth. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, yeah. So, so Christian churches were frequently built on the sites of pagan worship. Yeah. Well, the period of Sardis then would be from around 1560 to about 1798. And what happened in 1798? General Bofia... Cut the Pope down to size. Took it captive. Yeah. Our charming friend Napoleon sent, he got tired of hearing words from the Pope, and so he <laughs> sent his general down there and says, arrest that old codger. And they arrested him, put him in prison, and within the year he was dead. Yeah, do you have time for a short story yeah. about that? Mm -hmm. there, there, was, uh, there was a riot, uh, 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 an uprising there at the edge of Rome, mm -hmm. and there was a party going on, and the soldier, uh, uh, the French were celebrating, and the the, the um, Romans, um, the the, the uh, Pope's guard told him to shut up and go inside and cut it out. And uh, one person was shot uh, in that exchange. One bullet, one person shot. It was a general. It was a uh, it was a um, French general. But not only that. He was the fiancé, as I understand it, of Napoleon's sister. Oh, boy. That would do it. <laughs> and he was enraged. And so he sent Berthier down yep. in February 1798, took Pope Pius VI captive, and hauled him out of town. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, well, in that period of time, the original... Protestant reformers did a wonderful work. I mean, they did their homework, they dedicated their lives, they risked their lives. Many of them lost their, lost their lives in the process of promoting them. But their followers, pretty quickly, almost within one generation, said, okay, we've now figured everything out. We don't have to make any more progress. We don't have to do any more study. It's just sort of shh, coast on what our pioneers did. And that's pretty much the, represents the message to, 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 to Sardis here. And then, there, near the end of the period of, we call the Sardis period, it was marked by several very important events. One, the Lisbon, er, the Lisbon earthquake of November 1, 1775, the American War of Independence, 1776, 1755, I'm sorry, the earthquake, the American War of Independence, 1776 to 1780, going on into 1781, Three, the dark day and the moon turning to blood in northern England, New England on May 19, 1780. The French Revolution beginning in 1789. And five, the end of the 1260-day year prophecy with the arrest and death of the Pope. And what did all those events, how did those impact the world? 
Remember? Well, one thing, it, 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 yeah. turned, it turns people's thoughts mm -hmm. to religion. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that time period, there, there, there were several new religions, uh, Salvation Army uh, uh, and others in, in those two, three years. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there was just a, an outbreak of mm -hmm. uh, religious there organizations. Great, there was a great Christian awakening. Yeah, and out of that came the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Mormon Church, yes. the uh, the um, Mary Baker Eddy, Mary Baker Eddy and her group, and so forth. Yeah. So, lots of things were happening there. Which church came next? You remember after Sardis, Philadelphia. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Yeah. And during that period went from 1798 to 1844. So what happened in that short period of time? That was the great, religious the awakening. real religious awakening. Yeah. People, a lot of people said, man, things are happening here that look like they're a fulfillment of Bible prophecies. We better get our Bibles out and do some studying. And for the first time in, in history, there were Bible societies printing Bibles and scattering them around so that for the first time in history, basically, common ordinary people could buy a Bible. And they, they could have a whole Bible them, themselves that they could study. And there was a great religious awakening during that period of time. There was also one other thing that happened during that time, November 13, 1833. What happened? Falling the stars. Almost the most of that month, November, but especially in the night. It was so bright from all the stars falling as you could read a newspaper out in the middle of the night. Amazing. Well, the Church of Philadelphia was commended for its defeat of the synagogue of Satan. What do you think that means? What would a synagogue of Satan mean? The opposite I know of I'm asking a lot of tough questions here, yeah? The opposite of Harmageddon. Yeah, something like that. Armaged. <laughs> uh, op opposite, the opposite of God's faithful people, wouldn't it be, huh? A coming together of, of Satan worshipers. Or yeah. And um, some have suggested that for a little while it looked like the Roman Catholic Church was going to be was just going to fade into nothingness. Now we know that's not what happened, because Romans, I mean Revelation 13 is going to tell us what's going to happen to the mortal wound. Healed. Healed. Yeah. Mortal wound was healed. Well, and what happened next? Unfortunately, Philadelphia was not the last of the churches. What do we think happened between the Philadelphian period and the Laodicean period? What, eight, what happened in 1844, all you good Adventists? William Miller, and the, they thought Christ was coming. Yeah. What came to be known as the Great Disappointment. They were sure that Jesus was going to come at that point in time. And hundreds of thousands of people got real excited about the possibility. And then when uh, it turned out not to happen, what happened? Most of them left. It's almost, falling away. Almost all of them fell away. Probably 5,000 or so were left at the end. And what did they do? Started studying. They started studying their Bibles more carefully. They said, you know, we don't believe that this is completely wrong. There must be something that we have misinterpreted. And then they decided that, yes, it was the problem with Jesus was something was happening not here on this earth, but something was happening in heaven. It was the beginning of the time of the end. Tony, were you going to comment? Yeah, okay. So then there's the, the church that we talk about probably the most of all. It's found in Revelation 13, 14 to 22. And what's it called? Laodicea. Laodicea. Yeah. I think I just accidentally turned my thing off here. Forgive me. And the church in Laodicea starts, starts at what point in time? Sorry. When does the church of Laodicea start? About 1844. 1844. And the Laodicea, what does that mean? Do you know what the name Laodicea means? Not hot or cold. Lukewarm. Well, it's, that's, what the, that's how it's described, but that's not what it means. What does the word Laodicea mean? Literally, laos is the word for people, and decia is the word for judgment. 
the judgment right. of the people, the time of the end. It's the time of God's judgment. And I don't know what happened to my... So what do all these seven churches, how does that relate to the great controversy over God's character and government? That's a very good question. And um, I'm going to try to get my program going here, forgive me. Um, what we, what's going on with these seven churches is, is simply this. We have here a picture of the struggles that God has gone through to deal with different peoples in different periods of time who in, in each of these churches in turn dealt with different challenges that, that came up during their time period. Satan, and this is basically Satan's all-out effort to try to destroy God's church. I mean, how else can you describe that? Um, and we've talked about what's happened at different times. Now, in this final time, what what's happened? In, what hap What else happened in 1844 that has had a huge impact on on the on people on this earth? Do you remember? Charles Darwin. Charles Charles Darwin wrote a book entitled "On the Origin of Species,", Species. right? Well, Karl Marx wrote something about that time. Karl too, Marx did some writing about that same time, yeah. So and then, what you, and then you also, shortly thereafter, you've got um, uh, several of the encyclicals by the Pope. Mm -hmm. uh, the infallibility of the Pope. Uh, the um, there were three other I think those doctrines that came about about that time. Yeah. Well, in Revelation three. Verses 14, 22. Can I borrow your Bible sure. for a second here? Sorry that our technology is falling apart here. The message to Laodicea, Revelation 3, verses 14. To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, This is the message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness, who is the origin of all that God has created. So first of all, this person is who? Right up front. The origin of all that God has created. Who would that be? Jesus Christ. Jesus. Yeah. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you either one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And the word actually there means vomit you. Vomit you out of my mouth. And if you happen to visit the churches, uh, the, the churches around the area of Laodicea, there were three of them. Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. And Hierapolis became very famous because it had a whole lot of hot springs. Really hot water comes out of the, out just right out of the side of a mountain, runs down, and there's wonderful, I've been there, stayed in a hotel, you can sit in bay and, and, and soak in the hot tubs and so forth. They're just naturally hot water. On the other side of the valley, there is Colossae, where um, the, there was a, a river that ran right off of a high mountain and had really cold water. So here's Laodicea in the middle. They don't, all they have is they have they got some of the cold water, but had to run through pipes a long way through clay pipes. So by the time it gets to Laodicea, it's lukewarm. So they're not known for the hot water. They're not known for the cold water. They got they're the lukewarm people. How I wish you were one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich and well off. I have all I need, but you do not know how miserable and pitiful, pitiful you are. You're poor, naked, and blind. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold, in order to be rich. Buy also white clothing to dress yourselves and cover up for your same for shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and chasten all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If any hear my voice and open the door, I will come into their house and eat with them, and they will eat with me. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to sit beside my, me on my throne, just as I have been victorious and now sit by my Father in his throne. So what kind of picture is that? What's Jesus saying to them? Uh, to me, what, 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 what leaps off the page is that the chief church of Laodicea is deceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he describes how 
how they feel about themselves. You say, I'm rich and well off, have need of nothing. Yet God is saying, you are poor, pitiful, wretched, naked. And mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, a very big disconnect. But he, he couldn't be talking about us, could he? No, no. Oh. So they are self-deceived. Do you know, do you, can you think of any other parallels that Jesus might have mentioned earlier that there was a group that are asleep when they need to be awake? Story of the ten virgins? Ten yeah, virgins. Matthew 25, the story of the ten virgins, right? Well, should we take this Laodicean business seriously? Do you think... Do you think this is primarily addressed to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or who do you think it's addressed to? Well, you brought it up. <laughs> That's Matthew 25. Mm -hmm. Okay. So who, 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 was, who was Jesus talking about? Mm -hmm. He's talking, you know, he's watching the, the, the wedding feast, and um, he describes ten. Mm -hmm. Ten virgins, mm -hmm. pure women. And pure women represent what? The church, pure churches, presumably. God's true church. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, but you think of it as being a single church, 10 might represent completeness, God's entire true church. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't represent false churches because they're represented by impure women. Mm -hmm. And um, you drop on down in the story, and, and what happens? There are 10 who are not so smart. Five. I, pardon, yes, pardon me, five that are not so smart, and, and uh, uh, they come back and they beat on the door and say, Lord, Lord, let us in. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what, what, does, uh, what does the bridegroom, what does Je uh, Jesus say to them? Go away. Go away. I never knew you. Mm -hmm. Yet they are described as, ten, pure women. as, as, as pure women. Mm -hmm. uh, that should be very startling. Well, and you, they all went to sleep. All ten of them. All ten of them went to sleep. But but there are, but there's a large percentage of God's true church who are deceived, mm -hmm. and that's what we're reading here in Revelation three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> we do we if we take the the, the message of the Laodicean church seriously. Do we recognize that Jesus Christ himself, the divine Son of God, is speaking to us? Does he have any special messages for the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Or, I might add, for all Christians in our generation? Here's a, some words from Ellen White. Since the divine law is as sacred as God himself, only one equal with God could make atonement for its transgression. None but Christ... Um, could redeem fallen man from the curse of the law and bring him again into harmony with heaven. Christ would take upon himself the guilt and shame of sin, sin so offensive to a holy God that it must separate the Father and his Son. What does that say to us? Christ would reach to the depths of misery to rescue the ruined race. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 63, paragraph 2. God himself came to this earth to make it clear to us what he wants of us and what he is willing to do for us, not only by telling us what to do, but also by demonstrating it. By his death, Jesus demonstrated several absolutely essential truths. But the plan of redemption, now, now I'm reading from a passage found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68 and six, going up to 69. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world uh, might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the Prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And some of you will immediately recognize that she left out a word there. What word did she leave out? Men. Men, yes. Why did she leave out the word men? It's not in the Greek. It's not in the original. And it's not because it's not women either. It's 
talking about all human beings. It's not in the original. The original said, well, Ellen White's message is, and the original was, we're talking about everybody. To this result of his great sacrifices, I'm sorry. Everyone in the whole universe. Yeah. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man will not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. The use of a word there that says it would justify God, mm -hmm. and that is, in other words, is showing that God is righteous, mm -hmm. it would demonstrate the God, which is Romans 3 25 and 26. You mean the usual idea of justification doesn't apply to God? How could that be? Justice, justice and righteousness are really the same, word, have the same meaning. Mm hmm. Yeah, in the original. Yes. Yeah. Not the way it's come down to us in this time. When the Great Disappointment took place on October 22 of 1844, a large proportion of those who had been Adventists abandoned the cause and went back to their old ways. The Seventh-day Adventist Church was not reorganized until about almost, almost 20 years after that. But fairly early during the 20-year 20, 20 period, Ellen White gave this message. As I have of late looked around to find the humble followers of the meek and lowly Jesus, my mind has been much exercised. Many who profess to be looking for the speedy coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seeking more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They are cold and formal, like the nominal church that they but a short time since were separated from. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. What does that tell us? So, we have a problem here, right? You see, I think I've got my program going here again. See if we can get it to work properly. In the final seconds that you have, Ken. Yes. Let me just conclude by saying uh, we've spent some time now talking about the church, the history of the Christian church and its foibles down through the years. We need to learn from those lessons how to be faithful children of God. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you, for this opportunity to witness for you before others who might be listening in, and for the record that's been preserved for us from the book of Revelation and in fact through all of, Bible, all of the Bible. We thank you especially for this series of lessons about the great controversy. We ask now that the words that we have used here and mentioned here might be a encouragement, a blessing to those who are listening in is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.